Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma alimna ma yinfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zinna imman wa amalan saniha. Allahumma wafiqna ila ma tuhibbuhu wa tarda. Allahumma iftah alayna fatuh al-arifina bik. Wa aslih thata baynina wa aslih qulubana wa ahwalana ya rabbal alameen. Ameen. Uh, so I want to, as, as some of you may have seen on the announcement, uh, it wasn't specifically announced uh, earlier in the week, but later in the week, uh, as in today, <laughs> I, I, I posted what I was going to talk about. So uh, as some of you may know, these evening sessions once a month from myself are supposed to be uh, revolving around contemporary issues and how we can think about them as Muslims or deal with them as Muslims. Uh, one time we, we, we took the opportunity to speak on the concept of uh, racism and anti-blackness. And we used an article by Imam Zaid Shakir, Hafizullah. Uh, and then one time we spent the, the evening, I believe it was, discussing uh, what we can learn from hadith sciences in order to better understand the news. And this time we're going to talk about mental illness, mental health and mental illness. Um, so the opening remark on that is that I am not a mental health professional. So anything that I'm saying or reflecting upon in the realm of mental health uh, does not represent a professional opinion, but rather represents uh, what little bit I've been able to glean from conversations with professionals or panels that I've shared with professionals. Uh, or things that I have read uh, and how I believe that they overlap with some of the concepts that we have in Islam. So that should be the opening remark. Uh, we just last week, not this one, the one before, had a panel on mental health in Islam at UCLA. And we had Khala Nuha Shughairi there who's done workshops here before. Uh, and w one of the things that we spoke about I was tasked to speak about is this idea of mental health in Islam and the Muslim tradition and whether or not there are overlaps and so on and so forth. Uh, the first thing, one of the things that comes to mind in the beginning is that when we think about mental health, we often confine that to mental illness. And mental health is actually, it's about mental health. So there are issues of the positive side and there are issues of the negative side as well or the side that needs some help. Um, so this is number one. Number two is one of the things Khala Noha said, which just blew my mind, was essentially when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about people's thoughts and their emotions and feelings and their behaviors. And what's, why that's incredible to me and, and mind-blowing to me is because their thoughts, people's thoughts, their emotions and feelings, and their behavior. And these are the three categories that everything in Islam breaks down into and and certainly uh, Islam wants us to be whole you know, one of the things that Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah Hafizullah always says is he says that you know may Allah give us the tawfiq to help people become whole again you know, Islam definitely wants us to be whole and with all of the things that we face all of the difficulties that we struggle with sometimes people become a little bit fractured and sometimes things need to be reset. And sometimes we need to re-call uh, upon the values and, and, and things that we have in our tradition that can help us with that. One of our teachers, Sheikh Zakaria Siddiqui, Hafizullah, he used to say, لا ينصر الإسلام من هو محزوم في نفسي. لا ينصر الإسلام من هو محزوم في نفسي. The Islam will not be given aid or victory by those who are defeated in themselves. Islam will not be given aid or victory by those who are defeated in themselves. And so part of mental health is figuring out and, and walking and, and taking the path towards rectifying ourselves so that we can be whole and we can be true embodiments of this message that we have. And so when we think about this concept of um, people's thoughts and their emotions and their behaviors, uh, we're reminded, of course, of Hadith Jibreel. Uh, everyone knows what Hadith Jibreel is. Or some, we'll have to review it 
but it's always good to review. I think most people, many people probably know Hadith Jibril is the second hadith in the collection of Imam al nawawi his 40 hadith. And Hadith Jibril was called by Ibn Dqiq al-Eid, uh, Rahimahullah, one of the greatest scholars of Islam. Ibn Dqiq al-Eid called Hadith Jibril Umma Sunnah. He said this hadith is Umma Sunnah. And what he's, the, the, the body of idea that he's, he's pulling from there is that Surah Al-Fatiha is called Umm Al-Qur'an. Fatiha is called Umm Al-Qur'an. Meaning what? Meaning the Fatiha is the comprehender, it, 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 can, it combines all of the Qur'an, all of the meanings. of Umm is a mother, but Umm is also comes from like an origin of bringing things together. And, and so Umm Al-Qur'an is the Fatiha because the Fatiha covers the whole Qur'an. And Umm Al-Sunnah, as Ibn Dqiq al-Eid said about the Hadith of Jibril, is Umm Al-Sunnah because it covers the teachings of the Sunnah. And that's the Hadith of Jibril alayhi salam where Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an says, we were sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and a man came in upon us, and he was, uh, he, his hair was very black, and his clothes was very white, and it didn't, he didn't have any signs of travel, and he came into the gathering, and he sat in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he put his knees on his thighs, and he asked him, O Messenger of Allah, what is Iman? And he said, it is to believe in Allah and his Messenger in the books in the Day of Judgment, and Qadr, uh, and you know he gave the answer of the, the articles of faith and he said you've told the truth and the, it continues he asked him what is Islam he says Islam is to bear witness you know the shahada it's to establish the prayer pay zakat fast in Ramadan make hajj if you're able to do so he said yeah he said what is Ihsan he said Ihsan is to worship Allah as if you see him and even though you don't see him you know that he sees you and then he said what are the signs that, when is the hour and he said uh, that the one who's being asked doesn't know better than the one who's asking he said then what are some of its amarat what are some of its signs he said some of its signs are that the woman will give birth the master will give birth to her or the slave will give birth to her master and that the uh, barefooted Bedouins will compete with one another to build the tallest buildings and then he left okay this ended the hadith so this hadith is hadith Jibril and Hadith Jibril represents the three major areas of Islamic studies. And the three major areas of Islamic studies are Iman, Aqidah, and Islam, Fiqh, and everything that revolves around it, and Ihsan, which is Tazkiyah. So these three areas basically deal with the mind and how we think. Iman deals with the mind and how we think. Fiqh deals with the body and how we behave. And Ihsan deals with the heart and what it feels, what kind of emotions it has. So you see why when she said what she said, I kind of was kind of like blown away a little bit. Because these are the three areas. These are the three areas that we have concern about. The entire body of Iman deals with this question. So when we talk about mental health, we have to always come back to this foundation. Uh, I believe it was Dr. Imad Bayoun, may Allah preserve him, one of our local teachers, right? Uh, who I believe I was told he said I have this piece of information and I have a feeling that he said it I'm not entirely sure and I can't remember if I heard it or someone told me so I don't know that it's not and I don't so it's all messed up but the idea is that the concept was I shouldn't attribute it him, to him at all even though if it was his I don't want to steal it but the idea was that oftentimes when people have issues in their lives and, and they're, the things that they're facing, comprehending those things, dealing with them, acting appropriately in the face of them, and so on, you can trace the problem back to an issue with an understanding of one of Allah's names. And this was a beautiful concept. You know, how do you... And just this idea of understanding Allah's names and how that impacts your mind and how you process the world. The same thing with the Articles of Faith. The art, and, and many times, even the books of Aqidah will start with the whole section on, on the mind, on logic. And what are the types of, you know, we can't talk about, when we, so for example, they'll talk about Allah. And they'll say, what is wajib? Like, what is, from a mental category, what is necessarily true about Allah? It's necessarily true that He's wajib in wujud, for example, that He's necessarily existent. Or that He... 
uh, that he is different than his creation. His creation is nothing similar to him at all. Or that he has an ghina, that everything is dependent upon him. right? And he is not dependent upon anything. These are all things that we say about Allah. Uh, and then, But they'll talk about then because of that, like what is this kind of mental category of necessary things? Or things that are impossible, or things that are possible. And so a lot of times the Aqidah books will even start with these issues of philosophy and logic and so on and so forth, dealing with the mind. And certainly acknowledging something uh, as serious as the existence of God has major impacts on the mind. And it should have major impacts on the mind. Uh, not just the heart, but just how we perceive things. And then there will be an interconnection, of course. One of the examples that I gave in the workshop was that I think that before I was a Muslim, uh, I'm not, I don't believe that I'm currently absolved of this issue, but it's definitely different. But before I was a Muslim, uh, definitely struggled with things related to anxiety. You know, and I think a lot of people in America struggle with anxiety. You know, they have this kind of just un discomfort about who they are and what they are and making mistakes and all of these kind of things and like what people are going to think of them and all this kind of stuff, right? Believing in God helped me a lot. <laughs> because believing in God, you get all of these principles that they're principles in your mind and they affect your health, your mental health. Like for example, as long as I did what's right with Allah, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. That has a huge impact on your life. Right? That has a huge impact on your mind. Oh, they're going to think I'm this or that or whatever. Who cares? If what I did was okay, what I did was okay. Right? Or, uh, for example, that I am not Allah. And the necessary understanding of us not being Allah is that we make mistakes. We're finite beings that make mistakes. And we're not perfect. So, I don't have to be perfect all the time. I can make mistakes. Like that gives you a little bit of space where you don't have the same level of anxiety about making a mistake, for example. So there's things that we believe that should have a con uh, an impact on how our mind works. Believing in the existence of God should have a major impact on how our mind works. Believing in angels should actually also have a major impact on how our mind works. Certainly in the Muslim community, our belief in jinn has an impact on how our minds work. But I often wonder whether or not our belief in angels has an impact on how our mind works. <laughs> One time when we were at the masjid in Ramadan, uh, I don't know if it was a couple years ago or whatever, we were in the masjid in Ramadan, it was late at night. And you know, there's tarawih programs and qiyams and all this stuff. And some of the young people were there and they come running in. They're like, Shaykh, you never believe, you know, what just happened. I'm like, okay, what happened? There was someone, we saw them. And they walked behind the trailer over there. And then, you know, we went. And, and they were gone. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's late. You guys probably didn't eat enough. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, no. And they're like, Sheikh, we're really worried because we think it's a jinn. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, on a very serious note, I'm thinking to myself, why is it always jinn? Like you're in Ramadan, it's in the middle of the night, you have a Qiyam program, the Qur'an's being recited, all these people are worshipping Allah. Why do we have to go to jinn? Could it be like an angel? <laughs> Can we have an angel instead for once? Like, so my point is we believe in different things that should impact how we look at the world. Right? We believe in, for example, messengers. Messengers should definitely impact how we believe in the world. You know, um, one of the things about believing in messengers is just you have to believe that good people exist. You have to believe that good people exist. That's an important thing. It's a very important thing. And one of the big traumas that you deal with in, in mental health issues is what happens when people uh, no longer believe that good people exist. And oftentimes it's because they have bad experiences with religious leaders. Right? So then like these people who we used to hold in this position betrayed that trust. And so, do good people exist or not? You know, But part of believing in messengers is believing that good people exist. And believing that there are people who carry the message of those messengers. And they have that ilm, as we were talking about in the Jum'ah today. There are people who have inherited the knowledge of the messengers. They live the, the shadow of the lives of the messengers. 
beautiful, amazing people. And then that makes you realize that people can attain to such good states and that there's good in people and that there's, there's people that we should follow and there's examples of how we should live and so on. This affects, all affects our mind, right? Our thoughts. As well as the day of judgment affects our thoughts. Qadr affects our thoughts. You know, understanding that there's just limitations on things. Sometimes there's just limitations. And the relationship between aqidah and tazkiyah, the relationship between the mind and the heart, is very close. They're like two sides of the same coin. That's why some of the scholars, they say that tazkiyah is like aqidah applied, basically, in the end. If you apply aqidah, you have tazkiyah. Because your heart is, what is the point of tazkiyah? Is to get your heart only concerned about Allah. So then you applied aqidah. <laughs> right? So these things are very close. Like Ibn Ata'ala, secondary, rahimahullah, he says, سَوَابِقٍ himam لَا تَخْرِيقُ أَسْوَارِ الْأَقْدَارِ He says, the greatest of aspirations, they don't break the, the, the walls of qadr. It doesn't matter how great your aspiration is. You can't break qadr. Something, if it's not your qadr, it's not happening. Or if Allah has put certain aqdar in things, you can't skip them. So for example, alhamdulillah we're at IOK. IOK has produced over the years and continues to produce a lot of huffad. May Allah bless all of them and preserve them and their teachers and increase them exponentially in this life and the next, inshallah. Ameen. There is qadr in hiv, is there not? <laughs> you can't just be like, you know what? I think tomorrow I want to be a hafiz. It doesn't work that way. A certain amount you can memorize, you're going to memorize it, you're going to review it. If you don't review it, you're going to lose it. There's qadr in it. And so there's limitations. And that affects how we look at things. So all of this then is a like very basic level of aqidah and how we think about how that affects our mind. And how we should remind ourselves these things. We should remind ourselves what are the names of Allah. What is, it's part of the reason why it's so important to have a regular relationship with the Qur'an. The Qur'an keeps bringing us back to foundational concepts. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. You know, you feel like if you sit down and you read 10 pages of the Qur'an, you're going to find something that says Allah is qadir. It's a good reminder. Right? It's a good reminder. You're going to find something that says Allah is alim. You're going to find something that says Allah is hakim. That Allah is aziz. That Allah is ghafoor. That He forgives. Like These are very important for our minds. How we perceive ourselves and others. The second major thing then in our behavior is fiqh. You know, what can we and can't we do? And some behaviors are healthy for us and they protect us and some behaviors destroy us. And it affects our mind afterwards, it affects our heart. If we break in, and everything is tied. You'll see sometimes how someone, you'll see them, they're doing very well. Right? Everything is good, whatever. Maybe they slip into a certain sin. And rather than confronting their problem with the sin, their mind starts to change and their heart starts to change and they start reassessing all kinds of things. They start making excuses. They start changing Islam maybe in order to get past whatever their issue is. So the, the act then has an impact on the mind, on the heart, everything else. The third major category is the emotions, the heart. One of the major consequences of a serious path of tezkiyah is rida, contentment. In order to be content, you have to be whole. It takes a level of wholeness to be content. It doesn't mean you have to have everything. You could actually have very little and be content. But it's the issue of how we understand Allah and how we understand ourselves and how we make that part of our hearts. You know, that is a, as, clo as short of a journey it is between our mind and our heart, man, it's such a far road, is it not? It's such a far road. I remember one of the brothers when we were in Egypt, his wife passed away unexpectedly. He was a student. His wife was there with him. She was, mashallah, would pray in the night, support the family, everything else. He was a student of knowledge. And, his, and she was pregnant. And she died uh, in, during her pregnancy. Rahimahullah. And I remember driving with the brother, you know, and we're talking about what's going on. And we're kind of talking about how, like, you know, she was pregnant. This is, you know, you die the death of a, of, of a shaheed. She, was, she had left her home. You die the death of a shaheed and seeking knowledge. You know, all of these different things we were talking about. 
And he was like, yeah, man, I know. He's like, I know all of that up here, and my problem is getting it in here. <laughs> that is a long drive. Between those two things that are so close, it's a very long drive sometimes. So to get the ridha in there is a, is a very serious thing of our health and our well-being. And I'm sure people have seen others. Uh, I always think to myself about one of our teachers, Sheikh Ali Saleh, Hafidhullah, may Allah preserve him. I mean, just uh, you meet these people in life that, I mean, you look at them and you, you feel as if they were given everything that a person could possibly be given. And then you look around them and you realize they have nothing. But it's that statement of one of the early righteous people that if the kings had known what we have in our hearts, then they would go and fight each other with their swords in order to get it. You know, if they knew this thing that we have inside of our hearts. You see these people. Sheikh Ali used to sit in his home, mostly blind. His wife is fully blind. He's an old man. He lives in a poor neighborhood. He doesn't, have a, he doesn't even have a kitchen. He has like a stove in the hallway that leads to the bathroom, right? And uh, radi, 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 like so content. Everything in life is his. <laughs> Never hear like a word. Only complaint you would hear is Al-Azhar and the ulama in Azhar are not like they used to be. <laughs> and we miss the old mashayikh. This is his only complaint. This is the only thing he would really complain about. The th times have changed, basically. Times are not like they used to be. There used to be more mashayikh. There used to be so and so and so and so and so and so. But everything else, alhamdulillah. I mean, one time someone called. So I thought it was like a stranger or something. We realized at the end of the phone call while we were there, it's the sheikh's daughter. <laughs> the entire conversation is like, Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, ahlan wa sahlan. And he's so excited. Yeah, ahlan wa sahlan. Alhamdulillah. How are you doing? Very good. Allah ya karimik. The whole conversation is dua. And then he's like, Inshallah, we'll see you soon. We hang up. He's like, it's my daughter. <laughs> you think it's some you know, person who called him to check on him or something, right? But subhanAllah, so everything is good. That's what you're going for in the end, right? This is mental health on the health side. It's health. When all of those pieces come together. When all of those pieces come together. When the effort towards spiritual purification is combined with the effort of actually following the rules of Islam is combined with the understanding of how to perceive the world as a result of our iman, and all of this comes together, then you get the package, right? So that was all an introduction. Um, that was only based off of what Khala Noah had said. <laughs> you know, that mental health deals with our thoughts and our behaviors and our emotions. So Islam deals with our thoughts and our behaviors and our emotions. It shouldn't really, we don't need any other evidence to indicate that this is part of Islam. Uh, but I'll show you on the just, um, I think, you know, Islam is incredible. We're usually at the very surface and like the Mariana Trench is underneath us. <laughs> yeah. It's a massive body of, knowledge and learning and experience and everything is underneath and we're just like floating on top and we're looking at it and we're like well I don't know it looks kind of stormy today <laughs> you know but you didn't look down if you look down then it's just subhanallah and so I was asked one of the sisters in the community who works in mental health I told her I'm giving this this I'm part of this workshop can you recommend anything from the Muslim perspective historically and so on so she told me th about this work and she said that it's translated, so I found it, alhamdulillah. So this is the work of Abu Zayd al-Banqi and it's called Sustenance of the Soul in English. So I just want to tell you a little bit about Abu Zayd al-Banqi, some of the things that he talked about in this book, uh, some of the things that he said, and I'll read you some particular parts, uh, and, and who, this, who this person was and why this matters. Um, Basically, Abu Zayd al-Banqi was a Muslim scholar, uh, polyglot, you know, mastered many, many different disciplines as many uh, early Muslims did. You know, this is also part of Iman in many ways, is that if we believe that Allah is an Khaliq, then that means that everything in the creation is Allah's creation. 
And one of the things that they say about Surah Al-Fatiha is that Surah Al-Fatiha starts by telling us that Allah is Rabbul Alameen and Al-Alam is filled with uh, alamat or it's filled with alams that give us ilm of the one who created it. So it's an amazing word. The word itself, this, the, the, the world, the word for the world, alam, comes from a root of alam, which is an indication. So like a ma'lam, for example, in the road is a marker, it's a milestone. You know, an alam is a, is a symbol, is an indicator. So the alam gives us an alam of al-alim, the one who knows all things. Like everything, Allah, Allah is the Lord of the creation and all of the creation points us to the creator. <laughs> yes. So in the end, if you really believe that, you're going to study all kinds of things, right? Because all of those things are going to be interesting because all of them are going to lead you back to Allah if they're halal and they're good and everything else, right? So Abu Zayd al-Banqi was like that. He lived about a thousand years ago, okay? He lived about a thousand years ago and he wrote this book called Masalah al-Abdan wal-Anfus. And Masalah al-Abdan wal-Anfus is this book plus what came before it. So he wrote a work on basically medicine. Masalah al-Abdan is medicine. Different diseases, their cures, health, nutrition, especially early medicine. There's a lot of focus on nutrition, preventative care, right? And, and so on. And then he gets to Masalah al-Anfus, sustenance of the soul is how they translated it. So what's incredible is a thousand years ago, he's talking about this stuff. And basically what he's saying is that he, he, he's saying that as much as we can, are concerned for the health of our bodies, we should similarly be concerned with the health of our souls. And in this text, he, he goes over a number of things. Um, he goes over, for example, uh, fear, excessive fear. He goes over like anxiety, stress, um, obsessive compulsive disorders essentially like a pre-modern version of obsessive compulsive disorders and he talks about also depression and he even categorizes depression into different levels right so what's i mean again this is a thousand years ago <laughs> he's and he's talking about these things and he makes a very strong argument in the beginning of his text and his argument he's basically saying in the first chapter what is the great need of being concerned about this issue and the great need of it, he says, is that if we were to think about physical health, he says, many people can go extended periods of time without being afflicted by any sort of physical ailment. You know, they might not get a cold, they might not have any problems, they might be good. You know, like, I remember my dad, now he's getting a little bit older, but uh, I don't remember, like, my dad ever being sick. Alhamdulillah, you know, from age, I don't know, 40 to 60, I don't really remember him being sick. And that's a, you know, that can happen. People can not really get sick very often. He says, on the other hand, when we're talking about the soul and the issues in the soul, people have problems with these every single day. <laughs> and the other one he talks about in here is anger. His anger management is part of mental health in a modern context. Anger management classes, they send you to a mental health therapist, right? Mental health professional. So he's talking about mental, he says, someone has a problem with anger, they're going to have a problem with anger every day, right? It's not going to be something that just every five years they get a cold, but it's going to be something that literally every single day they're going to be tested with something that's going to trigger their anger. So if they don't figure out how it is that they're going to treat their anger, that's going to be a constant problem that leads to their unhappiness. You know, they're not going to be able to attain th what they should be able to attain internally. So the same, similarly, if someone struggles with uh, a lot of obsessions, it's going to bother them all the time. If someone is experiencing very, uh, a lot of sadness and, and you know, maybe coming into the realm of depression, then that's going to affect them in many, many ways. And it's going to affect them day in and day out. Right? So he says that actually, if we think about it and we start to analyze these things, we realize um, that it's more important than physical health. 
in physical medicine. So he says, for example, we start by saying that since man is composed of a body and soul, he is bound to face from each part of them fitness or weakness, health or sickness, or other symptoms that afflict his health in a negative way. The symptoms that afflict the body and upset its well-being are those such as fever, headaches, various kinds of pain that affect the organs. And the psychological symptoms that afflict a person are those such as anger, sorrow, fear, panic, and other similar manifestations. These psychological symptoms affect man much more frequently than bodily symptoms. Indeed, some people may almost never suffer from any or most bodily symptoms throughout, or mo throughout many, much of their life. In contrast, these psychological symptoms cause people to suffer all of the time. So you see the, the point that he's trying to make. He says, so we shouldn't be heedless of this. And then he says also something very interesting. He says, I know a lot of people that have written in the medical side that we talked about before me. And then he said, and I don't know anyone who's written on this before me. <laughs> Imagine like, <laughs> being in this kind of intellectual milieu, you know, I, I don't know anyone who's written on this before me. And he starts to then break it down and go into different areas. So he says that the human soul can be healthy or unhealthy in the same way that a body can be unhealthy or healthy. So the, the unhealthy soul is going to manifest issues like panic, anger, anxiety, sorrow, all of these things when, when it's unhealthy. And the body preserves, it's better to preserve rather than treat afterwards. Better to preserve rather than treat afterwards. And this is one of the, the, the things that we have to have confidence in, is that the body of Islam is a body of teachings that benefits us. The, the scholars, they say that the mission statement of Islam basically is جلب المصالح ودار المفاسد It is to acquire benefits and repel harms. This is what Islam does for you. Yeah. If you really follow Islam, you learn Islam, you be with the people who carry the way of the Prophet and them. You might have ups and downs, but in the end, if you look back, you realize, I, was, I got a lot of benefit out of this, and I was saved a lot of drama from this. A lot of, lot of issues. You know, the example that I usually give is in high school, most of the fights you see people get into, why are they getting into fights? Usually, it has something to do with women. <laughs> Guys in high school Usually the fight Had something to do with women If you don't do anything Before you get married You don't have any Of these problems You're not going to be Getting in fights In high school Right <laughs> So there's Or if you don't have arrogance And all these type of things Of course sometimes You have self defense That's a different issue But It saves you a lot of headache Islam saves us A lot of problems So it says that this uh, Prevention is better than, than treatment afterwards and just as the body has means of prevention, like diet, like health, like exercise, all of these kind of things that he talks about in the first half of the book, the soul also has means of prevention. So he says that, you know, the soul must be protected from those things that can attack or, or affect the soul externally or internally. So he says that externally you protect the soul uh, from outside elements such as what a person hears or sees that may worry or disturb him, causing arousal of emotions that include anger, panic, sadness, or fear, and other similar responses. You know one of the things that I think about? What do you generally see when you see a Muslim who's totally on top of all of the problems all over the world in the news? So the person's not doing so well. They're not doing so well. It's, it, the soul cannot handle it. This is my leaning is that the soul cannot handle it except if you're a very special person average person cannot handle these kind of things and i don't think we're actually meant to know all of these things <laughs> that's a that's an extension of my theory you know if you wind back and you don't have modern communications you don't know all these things you might know that there's a war going on somewhere you might know that people are dying but you don't have the video on your feed every single day this many people died, and this is the video of how it happened, and this many people are starving, and this is the way they look, and this is going on, this is going on, and this is going on every single day, 50 times, 75 times, 100 times, you're seeing these images, you're seeing these statements, you're seeing these numbers, you do it for every day, months on end. And then, like, there's a terrorist attack, and then Muslims are getting oppressed at home too, and then you don't want to go to the grocery store, and next thing you know, like, the person is just feza, like, they're just, they have, it's hard, right? So we have to be very conscious of this. 
Like how much of this, I need a little bit of this, I have to know some of these things because these are my brothers and sisters because I'm concerned about oppression and justice and all of this kind of stuff. But if I know so much of this stuff that I debilitate myself, I'm not, I'm not helping anyone now. I'm, I can't do anything good now. So this is, so he's talking about external things that will cause a person to have anger, panic, sadness, fear. You know, sometimes it's just we're taking too much in from the outside. He says also internally we have to protect the soul. So he says internally means to protect the soul from internal symptoms of negative thinking about what may harm the person with respect to the symptoms of disorders that we have described. You know, they just start, starts feeding itself. You, know, you get all of these internal, external things and then you repeat them over and over internally. So you're just playing them over and over and over again. So then it, it affects the soul as well. Uh, and he says one can heal themselves using two methods. First, this is an interesting one. He says, first, when feeling peaceful and when the faculties of the soul are in a tranquil state, one can convince, the, this is a very important, what he's saying. You do this when the soul is at a tranquil state. You don't do this when you're in the middle of your mess. Right? You might be in a hole. You don't do it then. You do it when you're in a better place. He says, you, 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 you convince yourself in your heart and in your mind that this dunya was not created to give people whatever they want. <laughs> you know. This dunya was not created for you to be in paradise. And this is, I think, one of our biggest problems too. Psychologically, we think, we act as if we're supposed to be in paradise right now. And I mean, it's, it, we have rivers, and we have water, and we have lawns, and we have palaces, and we have gold in our homes. We have like all of these marble floors. Like, are we in Jannah already? <laughs> and, this, and then what happens is you don't get Jannah because it's not Jannah, right? So you have to, then you get in that state and you help yourself. So this is the inherent nature of this life. So another thing that in a different place that he says that you could do is like when you're in a better state, you think about those things that are positive and good and you hold on to them. And then what you do is you bring them out when you go in a bad state. It's funny actually because for better or for worse, I'm referencing it. It's a song that I used to listen to before I was a Muslim, but you can take it whichever, you know, people can do whatever they want. Um, but he says... He's talking about a nice summer day, right? The, 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 the poet, we'll call him a poet, is talking about a nice summer day, okay? And he says, I wish I could take this feeling and put it in a plastic jar. And then whenever there's a problem, I won't do the actual rhyme, but whenever there's a problem, I'll take it out and I'll open the jar, right? So it's like, the idea is you have these beautiful experiences in life. So like, remember that. And then put it in like your little imaginary jar. And when you go through a bad time, then you open the jar. And you're reminded, you know, that these things pass. There's, there's, there's ups and downs. So anyways, the point is we can't go through all of his book. But he said some very interesting things. Um, there were some in particular that I marked. But I don't even remember why I marked them now. Um, maybe I can find the last one here. Yeah. So one of the things he talks about is how uh, sometimes you need external advice. He basically talks about counseling. <laughs> From very At this point, he's basically talking about counseling. He says, that is the benefit one obtains externally. Uh, I'll read you the whole part. Additionally, we see that just as in treating bodily illnesses, the external help one receives from therapeutic diets or a physician's prescription is more useful than a person's own internal treatment, such as preventing consumption of certain foods. So it is respect with psychological disorders. So basically he's saying is like, there's a reason why people have diet plans. It's because it's hard to do it yourself. You need some help from the, from the outside, right? He says the same thing with, with your psychological issues, that sometimes you need to talk to other people. He says that is the benefit one obtains externally from advice and counseling is more useful than a person's internal attempt at treatment through generating their own therapeutic thoughts. This is for two reasons. First, man generally accepts from others what he doesn't accept from himself. <laughs> you know, these scholars, they're very real. <laughs> they get you straight to the point. First, people don't usually accept from themselves what they accept from others. Second, one suffering painful psychological symptoms is so occupied and overpowered by them that he cannot clearly think how to overcome them. And so they need advice from someone else. So he's basically calling towards therapy at that time. The last point I'll make is about depression. 
and how he distinguishes actually between two different types of depression. I think he does three, but we'll focus on two. So he says that there's depression that's less severe, and this can be treated with therapy, like talking to people and getting advice and getting that support and conversation and so on. And then he says that there's a second level of depression that actually gets into the biological side, and it needs to be treated with medication, basically, he said, in their time medication, which is basically they need to adjust their diet and figure out how the internal things are impacting with one another and so on. And, and diet is a big issue in these things. What he's saying is that it can't only be treated through talking to people. There's internal things going on biologically that need to be treated, which will then open the door for being able to talk to people. So it's fascinating that he did that so long ago because that's you know a relatively recent phenomenon. A lot of these things that he's talking about a thousand years ago, we're literally beginning to be discussed and debated about and thought about in the last 100 to 150 years, 200 years. You know, So the point is to say that mental health is something that's important in our tradition. We should look at it as a means of gaining a wholeness in ourselves and coming to terms with ourselves and our actions, our thoughts, our emotions and everything else. There is great guidance, especially preventatively, of how to deal with these things in the core sources of Islam and there's guidance even in terms of treatment in the later sources of Islam. And the last thing is that we shouldn't be uh, hesitant or afraid of benefiting from professionals in this field. It's not like some sort of taboo thing. It doesn't make you a loser. It doesn't mean that your iman is bad or whatever it might be. It just means that you might be going through something. It's hard to process it by yourself. And you need professionals that can help. And alhamdulillah, in our community, you're having more and more people that have some understanding of Islam and they're going into these fields. Ideally, we would have people that have good understanding of Islam and go into these fields. So if we had people who were going through like the seminary and then they went and they got mental health training and they were able, they were able to understand Islam well enough to really sift through, okay, we're good on this, but maybe we have a little bit of a different take on that. You know, and really then like five, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you have people that are great experts in these fields, it would be incredible. And it would be a great gift to all of the people, not just the Muslims. But you know, this is something that's very important. And we need to be whole, because we want to be those who first of all meet Allah with qalb salim. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ salim. You want to meet Allah with a heart that's whole. Now, those are the ones who gain Allah's forgiveness. And also we want to be those who can serve and help others. As I said in the beginning, لا ينصر الإسلام من هو مهزوم في نفسي That Islam is not given victory by those who are defeated in themselves. So we want to gain to this level of wholeness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and to accept from us and to guide us to that which is best, inshallah. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam wa sallam taslima kathira. Jazakumullah khairan. Any questions or comments anyone wants to share? If anyone came in late, I made a disclaimer in the beginning that I'm not a mental health professional. I'm just sharing some thoughts. <laughs> okay, so don't go and like embark on a course of treatment based on something that I said. <laughs> Anyone, any comments? Yes. Yeah. Um. I don't know, it's a tough question. Th certainly times are different. I've heard Sheikh Hamza Yusuf say before that someone like Imam al-Ghazali had pretty much mastered like whatever knowledge there was to have in his time. <laughs> and you can't really do that anymore. I mean, it's just the bodies of knowledge are so vast. that is. I mean, mastering the Hanafi, the, the Hanafi madhab is difficult enough. <laughs> it take you 20 years and <laughs> forget everything else. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know that it's possible. I, th I think certainly there are people who are, have high levels of specialization in multiple fields. And uh, I think a lot is possible also if you have a culture that enables that and supports that and you have opportunity and resources that enable that and support that. I think one of the worst things we have in, in, in uh, speaking as someone who went through most of, am I still in that point? Yes, most of my life not as a Muslim, uh, 
our culture for education and learning in America is horrific. It's just so bad. It's not about learning. It's really not. It's not about being interested in things and learning things and all. That. It's about passing classes to go to universities to get pieces of paper to get jobs and pay off debts. I mean, it's basically what it comes down to, and that's just really bad. Except for a handful of you know people, there's exceptions, but that makes it hard because if you if you're like anything similar to me, you didn't care about learning anything seriously in life until you were 20 years old, and at that point you lost a lot of time. <laughs> you know, whereas if you have people who are literally caring about learning and being supported in their concern for learning from the age of five, it's going to be very different. The second thing that I would say on this is that. I, it would be interesting to look at, but I would imagine that these people became like that um, through not, simulta not simultaneously mastering fields. Um, and I think that there is, it's kind of like in fiqh. Fiqh is probably a good example of this. In fiqh, if you just study all of the madhahib, you can study fiqh for like five, six years and end up a mess. You still don't remember anything. You just don't. And you're, even in your fiqh as a skill might not actually be very strong. You know a lot of opinions, but your malaka, the malaka fiqhiyah, like the fiqh acumen hasn't been developed. Um, whereas someone who had spent like five years studying one school and mastering it, and then the sixth year they looked at the other opinions, they'd probably be stronger. <laughs> this is, both of them spent six years. But there's an underlying skill for how you process information and think about ideas and information and knowledge and so on that needs to be developed. So I think that when people attain like a certain level of mastery, that cognitive frame and psychological framework for how to deal with information when you've achieved mastery facilitates the mastery of other fields it doesn't necessarily it doesn't automatically make you a master but it makes your road to mastery quicker and this is all just theory but uh, I don't know I could be wrong just my thoughts I've seen it in my own life I'm weaker in fiqh than I should be <laughs> I know people who are very strong Like Sheikh Arsalan, one of my classmates He was very strict about only doing the Shafi'i school And he would study what he had to study for his classes and stuff But he was Everything revolves around the Shafi'i school Every question, every thought, every answer, everything So at the end The beginning stages The person feels like they're not as far and then in the later stages, you realize they're like 20 miles ahead. <coughs> so, Hafizullah, may Allah preserve him and increase him. He's in Texas. Yes. Abu Zayd al Benkhi. Abu Zayd al Benkhi. Benkh is in modern day Afghanistan, for anyone who's wondering. Alhamdulillah. Zakum la khairan. May Allah bless and preserve all of you and us, inshallah, and this beautiful, beautiful institution and its founders and its supporters and those who have had anything to do with its establishment and maintenance and sustenance, inshallah. Ameen. Zakum la khairan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Tasimi kathira. Subhanakum wa bihamdik. Nashallahu wa la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfirullah wa natubu ilayhi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.